live on Facebook and people are coming in to the Virgin Live. Oh, good. Good. So, should we start? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to People versus Pipeline. Maybe you tell people. We we'll wait just a few minutes to start, so we have more of a critical mass of people. And I have a really great idea. This is Mari. I have a really great idea. While we're waiting, people come in. I have one of my favorite songs, uh, "To the River," "Art of Virginia." If you can cue that up, and we'll play that while people are uh, coming into the room. That's it. Mm -hmm. While this is loading, I want all these songs that we're going to try to play are actually on a new, on a new um, Art of Virginia release. It's going to drop tomorrow. I'll tell you more about that. At the end. This video was on the road of the ACP, the now canceled ACP, and the soon to be defeated MVP. So let's listen to Josh and the crew. I'll take you to the river Tell you what I see I see the truth in the water Shining back at me Everything in time Since the world began Feel it breathing in the air Feel it buried in the land I'll take it to the river Tell you what I hear I hear the thunder in the distance I hear the river say Here come that company man Here come that big machine Here come the murder of the mountain Here come the energy
take you to the end. Tell you what I hear. Tell you what I hear. I hear the thunder in the distance. I hear the river say, Pray. Tell, tell me when you've already entered. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to People vs. Pipeline, and thanks for joining us. This is an event about the Mountain Valley pipeline struggle that has been ongoing in West Virginia and Virginia for the last nine years now. Uh, the pipeline was supposed to have been completed in four years, but amazing community resistance has slowed down the project and nearly stopped it several times. And we are very lucky today to have with us Maury Johnson, who is one of the leaders of the struggle against the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And he's also a friend and movement comrade of mine. Um, so Maury has an organic farm that is in the path of the pipeline. And so he has been personally affected by it. And he's a member of the Protect Our Water Heritage and Rights or Power Coalition, and also of Preserve Monroe. And um, he's with us today to uh, share his insights about why the MVP is such a bad idea and how communities have been fighting it for the last nine years. And what's next in the struggle against the pipeline. And with that, on to Maury. Yeah. Just Thank you, Bob's stop. office. It's an honor to be here. I've been in DC uh, a bunch in the last year or so. And this is an honor, it's really an honor to be asked to be part of this tonight. And I would like to welcome everybody that's here tonight and everybody that's watching this online. And I know there's a bunch of people back in my hometown that would love to be watching this, but there's a real critical water study that we finally got released and that they're having a big meeting at our local high school where people can hear about how important and how pristine the Monroe County water is. And that's something that's one of the reasons why we're fighting this, one of the many reasons why we're fighting this pipeline so hard. Go ahead, tell us more. Okay, <laughs> well, I don't know where to begin. Uh, this long, long saga of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. It's actually more than just the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So um, the uh, fracking industry uh, got on steroids, I guess, around probably 2006, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. And um, they were destroying water. Uh, many people will say they're destroying water. You can ask uh, uh, many people in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, how their water's been impacted with the fracking industry. Well, then they said, well, let's build a bunch of pipelines because we are guaranteed a 15% return on our investment. Whether the pipeline is needed or not, we build it, we're going to make a lot of money. So there's a bunch of pipelines that were proposed in the Northeast and the Appalachian region, you've heard of many of them, Mariner East, Constitution, ACP, Rover, Sunrise, MXP, Mountain Valley Pipeline, and they were more on the drawing board. And this amazing community of activists around Appalachia, New York, Ohio, um, started fighting these pipelines. The two that were in my area was the ACP, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which is now canceled. Thanks to a bunch of great organizers, uh, we joined forces across these pipelines and the MVP. The MVP probably was not as fiercely resisted at the beginning because I, I always say it was the, the stepchild. It uh, was a little smaller, didn't hit as many populated areas, and um, it took a while for people to take notice of this horrible project. Across some of the steepest slopes in Appalachia, across some of the most slip prone soils in the, certainly in the east and maybe in the united states through a 
through the Giles County Seismic Zone, one of the most uh, active earthquake zones in the east, through karst terrain, through some of the most biodiverse areas in the okay. in the world, along with the ACP. They went through some of those same kind of things too. And on and on and on why this is a really bad idea. <clears throat> so a number of counties in West Virginia, Virginia organized to resist this and educated citizens about what was going on. And then um, those citizens came together and created what has now become known as the Power Coalition, Protect Our Water, Heritage, and Rights. Um, our Power Coalition has grown far beyond just the MVP. We now are known as one of the national leaders in fighting these kinds of projects. We have made, we are, we are, we are part of coalitions that include Bossov's organization, the people versus fossil fuel, West Virginia rivers. I could go on and on and on. Uh, last earlier this month, I had to, what month are we in <laughs> earlier this month? I had to go to att attended a award ceremony in Pennsylvania and I wanted to thank everybody. Well, it would take too long. So I made a big poster of all the people that have been fighting. It was, it was lots and lots and lots and lots of names. And then I still forgot people. So this coalition has grown to include probably hundreds of organizations, large and small, national, international, even uh, local, uh, some, the, the coalition to stop the MVP is truly remarkable. So we have fought it using the law, using uh, other groups have used it in direct action, uh, protest. Uh, like I said, I've been to DC so much in Richmond, Virginia and North Carolina, and I go anywhere, anywhere I can go to get this word out. And I also work in coalition with other groups on their problems and their resistance. Like for instance, while I was in DC and I'm here during the FEMSA meeting and I'm doing this with boss off and tonight and tomorrow night, I found out that um, my friends from the Gulf coast were in town to do a press conference in front of the department of environment, uh, department of energy. Sorry. So I said, Hey, I'm going to go over there and support them. And uh, they'll be watching this and uh, trying to stop the LNG plants. The fracking makes the pipelines necessary to get the, gas to the coast to ship it because the companies can make more money selling us overseas which will then drive up mm -hmm. the prices of domestic gas mm -hmm. we need to stop exporting this gas someone asked me well we want to be energy independent we are not independent when we're held hostage by the fossil fuel companies to pay whatever they want so they can make exorbitant uh profit we need a we need a uh, energy system where all the people own the energy system solar wind you know uh, whatever it needs to be uh each country needs to have their own energy that's energy independence um i don't know it's just a, it's a long story the mvp fight um we had basically expose how bad idea this is even though state governments virginia and west virginia state governments were in the pocket of the fossil fuel and, and tried to change the laws their own permitting processes the the, the u.s forest service tried to change the permitting rules so we could get it through the national forest the army corps of engineers were trying to change the process so they could get it through but the court the citizens last defense against a wrong the court system uh said no wait a minute you can't do that so the fossil fuel industry and mvp went to uh this spring well went last year to senator joe manchin from west virginia a person whom i have called a friend don't need friends like that anymore so went to Joe Manchin and gave him a whole bunch of money to his campaign contributors, hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think, mm -hmm. the fossil fuel industry and MVP. 
and they tried to put this into a must pass spending bill last mm -hmm. fall and we successfully pushed back on that thanks to some great allies in the house and the senate um, and we killed that like five times so this winter when i left here last year in december i said this is coming back i saw the fossil fuel people here as i was leaving before christmas i saw them in dc mm -hmm. i saw them in the capitol and they got a bill passed well, it's actually a rider to a bill called the Physical Responsibility Act. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with the debt ceiling limit. They tacked this last four pages. Everybody in America needs to read that last four pages of the Physical Responsibility Act. It's called Section 324. It says that the Mountain Valley Pipeline, unlike any other pipeline or any other company, doesn't have to follow the rules. They are exempted from the permitting rules and all those permits that were struck down by the court as illegal and not following the policies and the laws will be reinstated within 21 days. And the citizens have no right to appeal that. They took my constitutional rights guaranteed by the constitution that citizens can redress their grievances before the court. We actually had a hearing in the fourth circuit and the fourth circuit judges begrudgingly said that it was out of their hands. Normally a case like that, they would just say that they're going to pass it on to the next court, but they wrote some pretty, what I think damning statements about this is a bill that's kind of ending democracy. As judge Gregory says, it's a shame that we're permitting pipelines by congressional fiat. Now, why does this affect everybody in America? Because they're already using this process to f permit other things. I was talking to my friend Elaine Tanner recently out in Kentucky, and uh, they're using it to fund a private prison in Letcher County. A, a private prison that nobody wants that they have fought back on was dead. Some money was given to, uh, I think, a congressman down there for campaign, and it has shown up on a must-pass bill. Mm -hmm. If we allow this, if this doesn't get struck down, any project that a company wants to do will be permitted as in a national interest. The Infrastructure Reduction Act said we're going to do all these different projects. Uh, hydrogen hubs and all this stuff. Well, if we don't strike down section 324 quickly, mm -hmm. then everybody who has any kind of a bad project that is not a good idea will be forced and they won't have the right to complain about it. This is what an autocracy mm -hmm. or a dictatorship does. So we can talk more about that later, but so the Mountain Valley pipeline is not just a bad idea. It's bad law, it's bad policy, it's not good for America and the turns it has taken. It is, um, we'll talk about the climate impact later, but so you need to find the Physical Responsibility Act that was passed in May and read those last four um, mm -hmm. pages, section 324. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here, let you, uh, I know you have some questions for me, but that's kind of the synopsis. We have an amazing coalition of folks from not just West Virginia, Virginia and North Carolina, because they want to put this into the, uh, into North Carolina through the South, what's called the Mountain Valley Southgate extension project. And I'm sure if they get that, they're going to want to, uh, do more and take it to the coast. It's coming to your neighborhood. People, these things are coming to your neighborhood. I am what a sacrifice looks like. Thank you so much for that, Maury. Um, I have lots of follow-up questions, <laughs> but um, I'll start with one that you just mentioned in passing, which is um, uh, the climate impact of the pipeline and the wisdom of allowing something like this to go forward while we know everything that we know about climate change at this point of time. Well, the science is very clear. We have to stop using fossil fuels. 
that's not easy to swallow, especially when you live in a state like West Virginia that is dependent upon fossil fuels for some jobs. Now, the jobs, some people say these are good jobs. Well, they're good jobs <laughs> is killing people. Mm -hmm. um, the industry is pretty well kind of given in West Virginia that it's cheaper to violate the rules than it is to follow them. We had a man disaster. I lost a friend in that man disaster a few years ago. It's called UVB or, or uh, uh, Upper Big Branch Pine over in Raleigh County, not far from my house. And uh, Massey Energy was violating mm -hmm. rules, safety rules. Matter of fact, my friend, six weeks, probably was less than six weeks before the disaster happened, was in my valley hunting on a neighbor's property. He says, I'm going to get out of here because they're going to kill us over there. Mm. He was 38 or 39, had a six year old son. He said, I want to see my son. I want to be around for my son to grow up. And it was less than six weeks after that. He was one of the people that was killed in that, in that mine disaster. Mm. And the CEO was given a slap on the wrist. Uh, I personally believe he's responsible for 29 counts of murder. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in the area think that. And he got maybe a year in jail and is now talking about running for governor or senator. So we just slap the, the industry just gets a slap on the wrist. We've had hundreds of water quality violations in West Virginia, Virginia on this pipeline. Um, probably more than any through the citizens efforts of going out and documenting all of this water quality violations. They've gotten about $3 million in fines, which is a drop in the bucket for a project that is now $7.2 billion. That's less than, I don't know, a dot, dot, dot percent. You know, it's, it's nothing. They build this cost in to the project. And even though we've driven the project up from $3.2 billion, $3 billion to $7.2 billion, they still get a 15% reduction return so mm -hmm. we're just making them more money if this thing goes into into service it's going to drive up the natural gas prices for everybody who is a customer of this the ultimate goal is they want this pipe this gas so they can sell it overseas mm -hmm. um, I, I think some of it may even go to china i'm not sure you never know once the gas gets into the system and it can go anywhere So uh, it's a it's a climate disaster. Um, Biden knows it's a climate disaster. Uh, Secretary Grantholm knows it's a climate disaster. Um, along with the Willa Project and the mm -hmm. LNG projects, mm -hmm. and so many more that we've been fighting across the country, we have to stop. There is no other. You know, they will tell you that they'll say, "Oh." We're going, to, we're going to replace coal with this. Well, we know that's what they're doing is just as bad. We don't need to replace coal. We need to, you know, there is, there is some uses for coal that's besides burning it. Mm -hmm. There's maybe some uses, small uses for a little bit of gas and oil in the future. We don't have to burn it. We don't need to be polluting water to get it. We need to be very, very meticulous and, and find ways to replace it with, with, uh, with other substances, which is possible. We put a man on the moon in the sixties in less than 10 years, because we had the national will to do that. We can transition this in less than 10 years. If we have the national will to do this. Thank you, Mari. That was a great answer. And, um, Several follow-up questions again, but again, based on something you were just talking about, which is how people in the community have documented the violations themselves, essentially doing the job for state regulators that state regulators were not willing to do. Can you talk a little bit about that citizen science effort and how people have been, you know, trained to document 
violations that the government should be documenting? So in the very beginning, um, was she Rivers Coalition, Child Unlimited, uh, Wild Virginia? I think there's probably the three leaders in all that training mm -hmm. people in Virginia, West Virginia, on how to do water quality manage, uh, water quality mo uh, monitoring. And this issue started in 2015 of documenting the quality of the water near where the pipeline might go. And at that time, there was a bunch of different routes. So we were testing hundreds and hundreds of spots every month, getting a database. There also was training on how to report a violation. We created the Mountain Valley Watch Program, which basically takes care of the Virginia side of the violations. And then West Virginia Rivers, which is worked with Mountain Valley Watch, they also help citizens file complaints in West Virginia. And then um, some of us just file our own. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty relentless. I've filed as of yesterday, 267 concerns or complaints. Some of them turn out to be like, I saw a fuel truck, or I think it's a fuel truck, refueling uh, or putting fuel into another uh, vehicle day before yesterday as I headed up here. Now I'm not 100% sure it's a fuel truck. It looks like a fuel truck. It had a placard on it and they were in a karst, right where a stream would flow in, in a flooding water. So I filed a complaint saying, if this is a fuel truck, which I think it is, this is a violation. So they'll have to investigate that. Probably right now they'll just say, you can't do that anymore. The governor of West Virginia, actually in 2019, uh, the DEP inspector was going to write some uh, notice of violation. That's what they called it in West Virginia, notice of violation for not having grass adequately on the, um, on the right of way before fall. And he says, I'll cut them break. Don't write them a violation on that. So the, 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 the governor of the state of West Virginia is telling them, don't follow the law, mm -hmm. cut them a break, make it easy on them. Um, I know that a few years ago on another pipeline, um, some citizens went out and documented some, some, a mudslide, went into a Creek, went across some people's hay fields and nobody was doing anything about it. And some folks, and no part of these folks are our part of our coalition went out and documented it, made a complaint. They sent some DEP inspectors over. Um, they wrote a notice of violation on that pipeline problem with mudslide. And a few months later, they no longer needed those inspectors, even though we're severely needing inspectors, those mm -hmm. two people or one person ended up not having a job any longer. Mm -hmm. Now, was it because they wrote that violation? I don't know. It looks very fishy. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just talking to Jess Sims today. Some of y'all know Jess Sims. She's with that. She was with Virginia Sierra and then she's with Appalachian Voices. Remarkable, remarkable uh, ally. Um, the, the Virginia DEQ Water Board, Citizen so Water Board, actually passed a policy a couple of years ago that citizens could no longer come to the Virginia Water Board and discuss Mountain Valley Pipeline. They are tired of hearing it. And you risked arrest if you did. And today they finally said, well, okay, they can kind of discuss it again. A citizen's board, government agency, has told citizens, you can't come to us with your concerns because we don't want to hear it. That's the way the government's working. You should be able to petition your, gov your government forever if there's a problem or a discussion. Wow. And that brings me perfectly to the next question, which is, to what extent has the push for the Mountain Valley Pipeline been grounded in corruption? I think the, I think <laughs> my opinion has been grounded in corruption since day one. Um, like I said, uh, it was proposed. Uh, uh, I know that back in, I'm thinking 2016 or 2017, if I remember this correctly, I'll ha I'd have to go back and read the docket. So there's FERC dockets. 
and there was a discussion about co-locating pipelines. You got these two pipelines kind of starting at the same place, kind of going the same direction. And um, uh, they asked if they could co-locate together. And I think ACP said something to the effect that, uh, I think MVP said, well, this is not, um, this is a, uh, not actually where we want to go. It costs us some cost overruns to move it that way. And ACP said, well, we looked at their route. It's unconstructable. 70% or 80% is unconstructable. Um, both pipelines were impacting the Appalachian. Here's, here's, here's some corruption for you. Both pipelines were impacting the Appalachian Trail. I'm an Appalachian Trail Conservancy member. The Appalachian Trail Conservancy has never opposed a pipeline or a power line because most of those people that want to build something go to them and say, hey, how can we reduce the visual impact from the trail? Mountain Valley Pipeline wouldn't even talk to do it. They didn't care. So the Mountain uh, the Atlantic Coast, the, uh, the uh, Appalachian Trail Conservancy wrote a number of letters and were involved in the resistance across the Jefferson National Forest and impacting the trail for over 100 mm -hmm. miles. In their own words, said this is going to have major impacts to the Appalachian Trail for 100 miles. Now, the ACP was a different story. Um, they were going to bore under the mountain. You could see it a little bit. It was going to maybe impact 12 miles. That's bad enough. There was a Supreme Court case over that one. And uh, uh, unfortunately we lost that case, but four days after we got the, three days or two days after we got that ruling, ACP says, we're going to go forward. And then two days later, they said, Oh no, we, we give up. We give, we can't do this. And, uh, but the Mountain Valley pipeline just doubled down. And I worked with the Appalachian truck and Service very closely along with some other people in my area. And on August 19th of 2019, I get a phone call. From a friend that works there said hey the Appalachian the um, Appalachian Truck Conservancy has struck up a deal with um, uh, Mount Valley Pipeline and we're gonna get 19 and a half million dollars and basically they didn't say this we're basically gonna drop our resistance to this mm. they sold the, the views of the iconic views of the Appalachian Trail they sold for 19 and a half million dollars I just found out this summer that some other uh, organizations that were fighting the Mountain Valley Pipeline were offered some major bucks, much more than $19.5 million. And they said, no, thank you for having some integrity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still a member of the Appalachian Truck Conservancy because I'm trying to become a board member because they said a secret agreement can't be seen. Maybe as a board member, I could see it. They've, they have done everything in the world to stop me from becoming a board member, including blocking my email address two years ago. So I couldn't even apply. That's corruption. Mm -hmm. That is corruption. When, um, senators mansion, Capito, Schumer, people that you think should be on your side, um, take large contributions from the fossil fuel industries. When your governors on both parties, or out there saying the people don't matter. The gas company matters more than the people and the water and our scenery and our animals. Some of the most biological sensitive places in Appalachia are being impacted. Mm -hmm. There is actually a crayfish on top of Peters mountain on the Monroe, West Virginia, Giles County, Virginia line that is found nowhere else in the world. It is so newly discovered and so remote, it doesn't have a name and therefore it doesn't count. It's not included in the biological opinion. Mm. I've talked to the foremost authority on crayfish in the world. He says, it's, I know it's there. I discovered it in 2014. I can't get up there and get the data to, to name it. Um, I've brought that up. The rusty patch bumblebee is a, is a, a bee that I know exists in our area. They won't do a actual survey for it. I've had four service workers tell me they've seen it on top of Peter's mountain. There was a, they hired a young lady to be the pipeline, uh, special projects person at the Jefferson national forest and the George Washington and Monongahela national forest. Um, I think it was a disagreement. I'm pretty certain 
that she was going to say this is not a good idea. There's been a big lawsuit over some stuff. Um, I, she's under a gag order, I think. I, I know where she's at. One of these days, she'll be able to tell her story. Um, they moved her out of the George Washington, out of the Roanoke office and put her in uh, somewhere in West Virginia. I forget what it was for a while. They brought Joby Timms, the Forest Service uh, supervisor that uh, was brought in there. He was taken to Atlanta for a while and then come back. So um, if you disagree, if you want to, they, they do everything. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just, it's the things I have seen. I would never have dreamed possible in 2014 before this started. Mm -hmm. I've had people say, I agree with you. There's nothing I can do about it. Yesterday at the FEMSA meeting, I spoke uh, about, uh, the mountain bike pipeline and explosions and one thing or another, I got a Facebook page. You can watch that. But the person that spoke to me before that has a key role in West Virginia. She said, it's terrible what they've done on the mountain bike pipeline. I can't help you, but what they've done is wrong. I've had senators and congressmen and representatives in West Virginia and Virginia say it's wrong. We shouldn't be doing this, but if I want my bills to pass, I've got to vote for this. I can't stand up to the administration. I can't stand up to Joe Manchin. Uh, I actually think Joe Biden has been held hostage by Joe Manchin. I, I, I want to think that he would do better. I hope that I'm not being colorblind. I think that Joe Manchin held up a lot of key votes to get what he wanted for the fossil fuel industry, not just Mountain Valley Pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, people are applauding that he's uh, not running again. Um, you haven't heard the last from Joe Manchin. I'm trying to push back on it as much as I can. But that's the corruption. That's the corruption of the government. And the fossil fuel industry has multi-billions of dollars, not millions, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And they're going against our grassroots and, and organizations that maybe collectively can raise a few million. And we're winning. And we're going to win. They may get this pipeline completed and then it'll be and enrolled as unconstitutional. That has happened. That has happened on the Dakota Access Pipeline. <laughs> When President Trump came into office, he greenlit, a, greenlit the permit for the water crossing. And I think a couple of years later, it was said it was illegal. Now they're still fighting over whether they should take it out from under the lake. I think that's the process. I think that happened on the Sable Trail, mm -hmm. too. They know that they pass these laws or these policies or executive orders. They might get the thing built before um, it's struck down. And now you've got a problem. We have an unconstitutional pipeline. And we'll talk about constitutional laws and, so, and pipe coding. That's a big issue right now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. What time is it? Um, 6.41. Okay. Well, keep track on the time. Yeah. But um, I think we've heard a lot about, Number one, how terrible of an idea this pipeline is. And number two, how relentless its backers have been and how highly politically connected they are. But just so as not to leave people listening with a sense of dread and loss of hope, I'd love us to now shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the more hopeful things. And for me, one thing that has been really striking is the fact that this pipeline was announced in 2014. It was supposed to have been completed in 2018. Here we are in 2023, and in the last official disclosure by the company, it was just about 55% complete. So how is it that a ragtag group of community organizers have been able to delay this pipeline for so long. 
because this ragtag bunch of organizers are much smarter than they thought we were. They thought they were impacting some dumb hicks up some holler that didn't have a, uh, any way to resist them. But we have an amazing group of people from across West Virginia and Virginia. A lot of us center right around Virginia Tech, but there's others too. We've had a lot of people that have moved to West Virginia, these remote areas, retired back home who have an amazing education, amazing organizing skills. They came because they wanted to get out of the pipelines and the, and the pollution and um and they've just dedicated they they see a special place as as my friend uh bert bondurant would say this is a fight to save this place mm -hmm. this place is special to me or this special place is special to somebody else this is a fight to save this place there are no other places like this place your home your neighborhood i don't think we're doing anything that we were taught by the Keystone XL people and the Dakota Access Pipeline. So all these fights, we learn from each other, and then we mm -hmm. add our own, and and we 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 learn the ACP fight. We learn from them. They learn from us. It's a collective. It's a national, worldwide collective of people who say enough is enough. We're not going to take it anymore. I think it's uh, Reverend Barbara. I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign. You know, enough is enough, and I ain't taking it no more. And I don't think it comes from way back. The coal miners said that. Um, the reason, so the hopeful thing is, is the resistance is still strong. The fire is still catching. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of misinformation put out by the pipeline company. Like, oh, we'll be have this done within a year and a half. Matter of fact, it was first said in the in the testimony by uh, Robert Cooper who is the project manager and that they were going to do the linear project. And they'd be a bunch of different crews. They'd start in 2018 in the spring and they'd have finished, they'd have finished within two years. He actually was optimistic. said it would be finished. Like, I think he said nine months. I don't know if that's true, but something like that it was just some ridiculous, which I knew sitting there in three different court hearings and a deposition for 11 hours that he was full of poppycock <laughs> to say it nicely. Um, he made statements that the pipe has to have to have the early entry because the pipe's got a coating on it. This coating can't sit out in the sun for more than six months. Well, it was already sitting in the sun for more than six months when they brought it to the road. It was coated in 2016 and 2017. They never brought it to the people's farms and properties until 2018. So it was probably expo uh, expi ex expired when they brought it in. And then they got a bunch of delays and this pipe coating has sit there and degrade it. And then, and FEMSA knows it's unsafe. FERC knows it's unsafe. They know it's unsafe, but they said it's not practical to bring new pipe in. Well, pro what that means is that my life ain't worth a hoot. Mm -hmm. That the elementary school in Nicholas County that they go beside, or in the Greenbrier County that they're nearby, or the Newport Historic District in Giles County, or Bent Mountain Community, or Raynell, or Linside or all these places from one end to the other, it's too expensive to protect these people. That a few deaths, a few wipe out of elementary school, will just say, sorry guys, that's the price of business. Mm -hmm. That's how many times have we heard it? It's an act of God. It's not an act of God. It's premeditated. They know what they're doing. They know the dangers. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, I was in New Orleans. I think it was two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, two with three, three at Pipeline Safety Trust meeting. And, and uh, Rich Cooper Ritz, who is one of the pipeline safety experts in this country, maybe one of the mm -hmm. best, expressed his concern, not just of the pipe coating. So the pipe coating, well, maybe. It's the failures, slope failures. And the possibility of a catastrophic explosion on these steep slopes. Experts know that we have a problem on our hands. Or as NASA would say, Houston, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. But we're not fixing it. The government needs to fix this. I really need to be home watching. I've been watching what they're doing, burying the pipe across my farm. And, and, and I have lots of concerns. And I actually 
talked to um, some of the FEMSA officials while I was at the pipeline safety meeting and back earlier in, in this, uh, here in Virginia when I was in a meeting here. And I said, I want to know this information. I'm a landowner. I know I want to know that what you're doing is going to be safe. As I'm talking about coding, this coding that they're putting on the pipe is supposed to be done by experts. What I've read in a factory, they're doing it out in the field. Should be 70 degrees. They've been putting coating on the pipeline when probably was 14 degrees. It was eight degrees at my house yesterday morning. So I don't know if they're still coating pipe now. I suspect they probably are. I don't, I don't know, because they won't tell us. So I asked the question, was this third party group that's supposed to be inspecting the pipe, did they inspect the pipe that was on my farm? Was it inspected? When was it inspected? When was it coated? What product was used? It took MVP a week to come back and say, well, we sh that's all confidential information. I, the public can't have it. Um, uh, rest assured that we're following all the uh, rules and regulations and the agreement. I don't have much faith in that. So now my next step is to ask FIMSA for that. And tomorrow I hope to. for citizens to know whether or not things are being done correctly if their father rules is not available to the public because in their eyes we don't matter mm -hmm. and um, I know I got a friend who who fought the uh, ACP whose land was actually uh, impacted by the ACP route who has filed many FOIA requests with the government things that should be made available to the public by law. And he's waited two, three years. That's kind of corruption, but we're not going to give up. This isn't, we'll never give up. We have to live here. We have to live with this pipe and we're going to live without it. If we have anything to do with it. So should we take a little break now? Let's take a little break. I got a, I, I picked up another song. I thought that maybe people might want to at home, might want to take a bathroom break or get a drink of water or something. Uh, so uh, some great friends, uh, formerly known as Lobo Marino, now known as Holy River. Uh, there's a song that I think would be a great for a short break. It's uh, called Spirit Rise. And this was actually filmed at the Yellow Finch tree set that set for 932 days or something. So we'll get that pulled up here and, get, and they can enjoy this for a few minutes while we're, while we're uh, taking a break. We'll get there. <laughs>
It's going to be a long, cold winter here in Jordan and across the world. So that pops off is why we are winning. We have amazing activists. We have amazing art. Every great movement has great artists. As you see behind you, the, 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 you want to hold that sign up? Yep. So um, we did a violation visual for flipping around. So this is a Sabina thing. This is a... Um, um, says the violations and people read what the violation was. Well, we had this, and so all of the ingredients and others turned it into this great art, and um, they're great artists, and uh, great music, great artists. We have, uh, we have puppets, um, and those energize your spirit, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more. Little little technical difficulty here. <laughs> Are we good to go? Good to go. Uh, our movement is not just about the Mountain Valley Pipeline. It's about what citizens realize has to happen if we want to save this planet. We have to stop the Mountain Valley Pipeline and other harmful projects. You know, you hear. You hear Willow, you hear LNG and Port Arthur, and I, there are others. I have friends in, um, I live on US 219 at the southern end. On the northern end of US 19, 219, up in the Buffalo, New York area, there's a pipeline called the uh, uh, Northern Access Pipeline. Not quite as long as ours. Doing the same thing, going through some critical habitat for hellbenders and other things, destroying family farms and businesses. We have to stop that one too. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of them that we have to, and, and it takes everybody to pitch it in. Some people can write, some people can don't take pictures, some can just donate money. And we'll talk about that, places that need your money. A lot of places need your money, <laughs> um, but some critical people. So that's why we'll win. We have these people keeping us energized, leading us in the marches. And that's why we will win this fight. Yeah, thanks for that, Mari. Uh, I must say, as someone who doesn't live on the Mountain Valley Pipeline path, but you know, who's been there a few mm -hmm. times and also <coughs> attended a lot of uh, MVP solidarity events in the Washington, D.C. area, one thing that has really struck me is how much art and music there is in that movement. And, and that really is something very special. So um, that brings me to uh, another critical question, which is, um, it's really striking how this one pipeline struggle in a relatively remote corner of the country where many people haven't been necessarily has become such a national flashpoint and how you know uh, people who care about these issues from all over the country really care about the MVP. Um, could you tell us why that is? Well, part of it is thanks to Joe Manchin. <laughs> Joe Manchin how it made this the biggest pipeline fight maybe in the world. He exposed the corruption on a supersonic scale. I told somebody last, you know, last uh, last September when he had this thing and uh, first put into the funding of the government bill, whatever that bill was called. I suddenly had all the national media on my farm, <laughs> and it's in about eight days I had. Washington Post, uh, Guardian, NPR, I had everybody. They were all there. And that's when this exploded. And when we kill this pipeline, I'm going to thank Joe Manchin for helping us. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been tough. You know, it's been very defeating. Some people, some people just said, well, we can't do anything about it. But then we just took a deep breath and started back into the work. Um, there are, um, this is a sh has become known as, along with some other high-profile places, as a fight for the climate, a fight for a livable future, 
a, f- a fight for our grandchildren and their grandchildren, what kind of world do we want to live in? Uh, what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where corporations rule, can do whatever they want? You have landowners have no property right. I wrote a paper, it's actually for a FERC filing about, and I actually talked about this at um, the Pipeline Safety Trust meeting. So goes back to ancient Rome, the Magna Carta. Um, property rights were the basis of your democracy, people's property rights. It was actually enshrined in the Constitution. It was actually con- reconfirmed in the 50s, I think, by Congress. And um, that's the basis of our our democracy, our, our country. You have a determination over what happens to your property. Now, there's another thing that we stole the property from the Native Americans. That's a whole other issue that we need to address. But I'm going to we can dive down that rabbit hole, and I'm not. We don't have time to do that. That was something that needs to be rectified. Mm-hmm. But. Um, the Natural Gas Act that was passed something like 80 years ago was unconstitutional. In many people's opinion, it was unconstitutional, but nobody challenged it. We're challenging it. The Mountain Valley Pipeline uh, struggle has actually been working on this issue for a number of years, and there is a um, lawsuit. This is the third iteration of it called Bohan versus MVP. Well, no, it says Bohan versus FERC. We were challenging the wrong people. It says they don't have the right. Only Congress has the right to um, exercise eminent domain. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to let the lawyers talk about that. If you want to see the press releases, Hugo Collins, they got a press release out, several press releases. They're the ones, brilliant uh, young attorney over in uh, Roanoke, Virginia area. So this has done some amazing work. And... Um, so uh, <clears throat> that lawsuit should have been heard a year ago and it scares MVP and FERC to death and they do everything in the world to try to delay it, delay it, delay it. Uh, I think their strategy is that eventually the pipeline will be finished. They say, well, it's moot. It's not moot. It's not moot. This is, this is about property rights. Who has the right to take your property? Does a private corporation have the right to take your property, destroy your business, your farm, your livelihood, your well-being, in order so they can make massive profits. That's what this is about. And then they tried to say that uh, the Section 324 would just have do away with uh, the this constitutional challenge. And we said, well, no, it doesn't. And maybe we'll talk about that too. So. Go to Hugo Collins' website, read the press. I'm not, I won't speak for the attorneys, um, but the, there's three landowners in Virginia uh, that are part of this challenge, will have major impacts. We'll find out whether this country is a democracy or an autocracy when this thing hits. Mm-hmm. We'll find out if the court actually protects the people or protects corporations. So uh, amazing work being done by some really brilliant people. We have unlikely allies. You know, the, the Keystone XL had the cowboy, uh, uh, cowboy Indian Alliance. Mm-hmm. I think we have the alliance of everybody. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. I mean, we have people that's working on this issue from all over the United States and beyond. So that's why we're hopeful. That's why we think that this is a lot more. They want you to, they want you to believe <clears throat> In the major media, a lot of media uh, proved them off the ACP and the Constitution and a bunch of others, the Coos Bay uh, LNG plant uh, that they were wanting to build. We're going to prove them wrong here. This is not a done deal. People can fight back. You need to stay strong. And um, it's exhausting. It's really exhausting. Sometimes you got to step back. We have people have stepped back for a while and then they've come back. You got to take care of yourself. 
you got to have some joy and some music. And we're, and we're actually doing some of those events across Virginia, West Virginia now. Uh, we're picking them up again. Uh, so people in the Bent Mountain area, Roanoke, if you want to come down to Roanoke, the Bent Mountain area in January, go to the Power website. You can see the event we're having over there. we got some stuff planned in West Virginia in the spring uh, to say thank you for your, your support. We're still here. We're not going anywhere. Uh, we have amazing people. I mean, just ordinary citizens are just remarkable. I think of Red Terry and her daughter Minor and all the tree sitters that have taken turns in trees and people from around the country who have come down and despite being threatened to be called a felon, have come and locked themselves down to equipment. Now, I didn't do that. That's not my role. Some people say, do you support that? Well, you know, you decide whether I support that or not. But I will say this. If we had not had tree sitters in Peters Mountain at the very beginning, MVP would have blazed across the National Forest and had this pipeline in the ground before we got to court. Here's corruption for you. So we filed the lawsuit. I was actually a part of that lawsuit about the National Forest crossing in 2018, spring of 2018. And we asked the court to hear this case, why they couldn't, why this permit was illegal and asked the court to give us an injunction of them cutting the trees. The court says, okay, we're going to give them five days to tell us why um, they shouldn't be given an injunction. And what the MVP people did was they brought in a blizzard on Peter's mountain and other places. They brought in every tree cutter they can get to cut all their trees down in five days and said, well, we don't care if you're giving us an injunction or not. We've done cut all the trees. There's video. Appalachians Against Pipeline had tree sitters on Peter's Mountain. They have video on their website. You may have to go back a while to see it. Of 60-mile-an-hour winds on top of Peter's Mountain, which is one of the uh, strongest wind corridors in the east, and they were cutting trees, putting their own workers at risk because they cared nothing about their own workers, despite them telling their own workers that they, um, they're working them to death right now. They're working around the clock, I mean, sometimes around the clock, We're working seven, six to seven days a week, daylight to dark, sometimes after dark, around the clock. Um, I know people have refused to work for them. People have quit. Um, they're saying that they have workers that refuse to work. They can't get this done because people don't want to work for them. Well, I don't want to work for them because they're not, they don't really care about their workers. They care that their workers work around the clock and they're getting paid well because they wouldn't work otherwise. I've had a number of workers who have told me I quit, I'm quitting. I can't do this. Put back in 2017, uh, a number of surveyors I've talked to said, this is a disaster. I can't wait to get off this job. So, um, it's not, uh, it's not something we should be, don't believe everything that the pipeline company tells you. They're going to paint a rosy picture. How beautiful, how great, how this is going to be a engineering uh, marvel. It's an engineering disaster, in my opinion, and others, some others. So, um, and when you speak out against them, they want to throw suits up against you for, for $5 million. Or it's talking to a fella, friend, now friend, from uh, Pennsylvania, who's been challenging the industry on the uh, claim that the fracking is harming the water and they filed a lawsuit against him like seven years ago for $7 million and, and trying to stop them. These slap suits got to be stopped. We got to do legislation to, to stop that kind of stuff too. Um, Thanks for bringing up slap suits. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute, but, uh, in the meantime, you know, what you've been talking about has sparked, you know, two questions. Uh, I'll go with the first one, you know, I'll go with one of them first. So, you know, you mentioned how the company um, has been terrible to their own workers and experts. The communities it is impacting and the environment you know why would they suddenly become 
angels when it comes to their own workers. So that's that part is not surprising. But one thing that um, uh, the MVP and many such projects keep saying, they keep justifying their existence by saying, oh, we are creating so many jobs and we are bringing needed economic development. Um, how would you characterize that claim of theirs? A couple of years ago during the pandemic, when everybody was stuck at home, um, I would watch a lot of movies. I was watching YouTube and YouTube was doing free movies. And I watched a movie called The Reader and Kate Blanchett, have you seen some of you? Kate Blanchett got an Academy Award for that. Ray Fiennes was in that. It's a tough, tough movie to watch. It's a really tough movie to watch. It's about the Holocaust and a particular incident that happened there. And what struck me in that movie was a claim. So this is a, a Nazi concentration camp and stuff. And they asked this guard, why did you do the things you did? She said, well, it was the best job I ever had. It was the best job I ever had. They paid me really well. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is a Holocaust, you know, but we've built a lot of things in this country, in this world, because it's a good job mm. with no other concerns about the ramification of what that job brings about. But this was a really good job. It paid really well. And I could feed my family. I can buy that brand new jacked up truck or that rifle or take that great vacation. I have no concern about what it's doing to everybody else. But I'm having a great job. It's a great job. It pays a lot. I want people to think about that. Mm. not just pipelines and LNG plants and stuff. What are our priorities? What are our priorities? Is it money or having a livable future? And that's why I say uh, we need to change the priorities. We have to have somebody said a paradigm shift. We need a paradigm shift uh, of what's important thank you that was a profound answer and coming to something more hopeful uh, so the mvp struggle has gone on for years and you hinted at this already but it would be very instructive to learn how you sustained yourselves how you kept your spirit going, <laughs> how people have been able to be in this struggle for so long. I live in West Virginia and it's just something that we do. Um, you find ways to do it. Look at, look at the coal mine wars and the, mm. and the struggle for Blair Mountain and, and all the resistance to the mountaintop removal and the beautiful activism that happened there. Uh, the West Virginia teacher strike, I was part of the one in 1990. Uh, wasn't teaching in the last one, but I went out, I went out to, with my fellow teachers and, and, and walked the picket lines. Mm -hmm. In 1990, when we had a, a teacher strike, just as I was starting my education career, we had coal miners coming out with us. Um, so you, you, you're, you're, you're sustaining yourself by associating with like-minded people. Uh, mm. In West Virginia, the fossil fuel industry has created this friends of coal. Well, friends of coal is friends of coal companies, not coal miners. Mm. Um, it's, it's a whole PR scheme. Uh, a lot of people are afraid to speak out in some areas for things that mm. bizarre things that happen to their cows or their barns or their fences or their, you know, the, it's well documented what kinds of things happen to you. Um, I would go to Richmond a lot. And people say, why do you go to Richmond so much? <laughs> because I had people like uh, Lanny Sullivan and Josh Fanna and Jess Sims who were doing some great work and doing some great rallies. And we brought that back to West Virginia. So uh, you sustain yourself by coming to DC and talking to people like you and uh, the other people's here tonight. Um, you find strength in the diverse community that we've built. 
And you've got to look outside of your own community. You've got to be, you've got, we got to, this coalition has to be nationwide. It can't be, I'm just going to fight for my area. Well, you're fighting for your area. You're actually fighting for everybody. We're all learning. This is all, this is a work in progress. And when you run into a wall, like section 324 of the physical responsibility act, you find a way to tear that wall down or go around that wall and, and continue on your path. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect opportunity to um, uh, bring up my last question. Oh no, I changed my mind. I'm going to ask you another <laughs> question okay. before my last question. So uh, two more questions. Uh, so you mentioned slap lawsuits, strategic lawsuits against public participation. Can you tell us a little bit about number one, what those lawsuits are, and number two, what kind of lawsuits you're facing right now? Well, I'm not, as yeah. of yet, I'm not facing it myself. But your movement, yeah. 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 There are many people who are facing lawsuits because they have protested, have gotten away, got in the way, chained themselves to some equipment, you know, um, maybe uh, said something that defamed the industry, whatever industry it might be. They don't like you saying bad things about them, so they get all, uh, or my grandmother said, I get all huffy about it and they file a lawsuit against you. They know that probably in the end, they're going to lose the lawsuit or it'll be dismissed. But meanwhile, they're going to tie you up in court for years mm -hmm. and make you spend lots of money and resources fighting that and not fighting them. They have an army of lawyers. They have, mm -hmm. you know, when they're a multi-billion dollar corporation or organization, they can just tell the lawyer, mm -hmm. just keep them tied up in court. We don't care if we win this or lose this or dismiss it in five years or seven years or 10 years. Um, I had a friend who was a TV reporter who um, was reporting on the Mountain Valley Pipeline. This is an Emmy award-winning reporter, friend of mine, who uh, got into a fight with the company he worked for over some reporting that was done on the Mountain Valley Pipeline and um, was got into an argument with the corporate media he worked for, and they had a lawsuit over the whole issue. And his lawyer said, well, we're going we're gonna to settle this. We can win this in five years and you'll spend 20, 30, $40,000, $50,000 to win this. But they have, they're a corporation. They have lots of money. They have lots of lawyers that can fight you. This happens frequently in the big industry. They know that having that army of lawyers on their side will well, some resistance. Um, so that's where this reform's got to come. You know, the people talk about legal reform. That's where the legal reform's got to be. We got to we got to penalize companies that do that. That's an excellent observation, Mari, and especially the point that they file these lawsuits knowing that they're without merit and they cannot win. The intimidation is the point. The harassment is the point. Yep, exactly. So that brings me to my last question. How, and I'm going to put up some resources on slides in a minute, but before that, I'd love for you to talk about how can people who are concerned about this, but maybe don't know how to get involved in the fight against MVP, what can they do? How, how can people in different ways contribute to the struggle against the MVP? That's a really good question. There's a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways. If you're an artist, musician, art, Art of Visit Virginia has a great place to go and put your resources. If uh, Appalachian Voices has been a great organization that's been, that needs support, you can go to AppalachianVoices.org. Uh, there's a whole page there how you contribute to them. Power, P-O-W-H-R.org. You also go on Facebook. 
uh, there's there's ways to reach out to them in your uh, in West Virginia. West Virginia Rivers Coalition has done some great work, not just protecting the water on the apple on the on the Mountain Valley Pipeline, but across the state of West Virginia. An awesome organization. Sometimes we don't have money, but you can volunteer. You can volunteer to help them. The, the, into, into that uh, type of uh, uh, resistance. Appalachians Against Pipeline has a great organization that's, that's standing away. I have some great friends in Climate Defiance. Mm -hmm. You know the Climate Defiance people. Love them to death. They're making a difference. Not just the Mountain Valley Pipeline, but across the climate. Um, there's just so many groups. I mean, I, I wish I could just put up the list of people. There are Sierra Club, NRDC, C can I mean it's it's countless, but uh, if you really want to reach out to the Mountain Valley Pipeline, Power.org, Appalachians, Appalachians, Washington Rivers are great organizations. Uh, there are sort of local organizations that are probably in your neighborhood. Third Act, great mm -hmm. group. I'm a I'm an unofficial well I'm a I'm an unofficial member of Virginia Third Act. Great people there at Third Act. Uh, love them to death and the things they do because they're they're hitting the financial the people that's that's financing the climate destruction and they're done with rocking chairs <laughs> the best movement in the world uh so uh not only rocking chairs but other ways too uh, the rocking chairs has kind of become a thing with them especially in virginia and there's a story about that i'll tell you sometime how that all kind of got started and i'm kind of kind of part of that in a roundabout way but yeah it's um there's a lot here we got some power athletics pipelines Appalachian Voices. Uh, you didn't put up uh, West Virginia Rivers Coalition, but you're not as familiar with them as you are those others. Um, those are some great organizations to look into in in Appala mm -hmm. uh, Wild Virginia. Uh, that group is a good group here in Virginia. Uh, Seven Directions of Service yeah. mm -hmm. down in North Carolina. Uh, that's on the Mountain Valley Southgate in the coalition with us. Seven Directions of Service is a great organization. Um, I can sit here all night and just read off them. So uh, go to the people get versus fossil fuel page and mm -hmm. you see how you can get involved if you're not just Mountain Valley Pipeline, but other projects. So that's why this coalition is more than just power. Mm -hmm. So well, well, how much time we have? Well, you know, right now. Oh, we got plenty. Oh, we, we got still time. got time. We got time. We got time. There, maybe, there's, maybe there's questions that people in the audience yes absolutely people sh should start putting questions in the chat and we can take in the q and a feature and and you know we'll we can have questions in the room as well uh, but before that i just wanted to flag one thing which is you know we heard about these slap lawsuits so there's going to be a webinar on um Thursday, December 14th, that's two weeks from today, uh, specifically on slap lawsuits and how to fight back. And you'll see a link on the slide uh, and in the chat to for you know how to register for this uh, uh, for this webinar. Uh, and there's also a slide with some of the ways you can be, uh, you know, some of the ways you can contribute to this movement going forward, uh, which is, yeah, so um, getting involved in the effort to get banks to stop financing the pipeline, because obviously, you know, any project like this needs finance. And if you can hit the banks, you can and, impact the project. And other investors and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You, you have several things up here. Uh, WestGeneRiversCoalition.org is another one that we need to put up. Uh, they've done some great work with me. I've done some great work with them. Uh, mm. Just an awesome group. They they started this. Um, they were a small group of about three people, and then they got involved in fighting the Mountain Valley Pipe and other stuff. And they've they built a pretty strong coalition over there in the state of West Virginia. Mm. Uh, check them out. Um, they're just an awesome, just a, an awesome group of people. Uh, that really care we actually have an official water keeper angie rosser is known mm -hmm. as the official water keeper of west virginia and there's a actually a a zoom call a zoom a, 
an interview with her if you could see on their on their page so there's a lot of great people across West Virginia, North Carolina, and, and elsewhere. Um, so we got any questions yet? We. <laughs> I think Sabine, I guess it's Sabine, started to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah let, them, let them ask questions if they, anybody wants to see. See some great friends here. There's Karen, Andy, Tom. Anybody? There's Sabine. Yeah. Um. Uh. If if you have questions, you know this is a small and informal enough group. Uh. You can just come off mute and ask your question instead of writing it in the chat or in the Q and A. We got one question in house. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering. You mentioned the uh, that section three two four, and you said it's it must be stopped. And I'm just wondering what. It's okay. The question the is. To get it to stop right now. The question with uh, here in the audience is uh, how do we stop section three two four? Okay. Well, um, Mount Valley Pipeline actually said they actually fast tracked our fight against three two four. Uh, going to court is a slow process, but they made the mistake of saying, well, three, two, four would throw out the constitutional challenge. And we said, well, no. And since you brought it up, three, two, four is also unconstitutional. <laughs> and so now it's in the court system. Uh, the Southern environmental law center has just filed an amicus brief. So if, um, uh, if you want to send, I don't know, there's other, just highlight this. How do you stop it? Chat about it. Talk to your neighbors about it. Make people aware of it. Tell people that we need money donated. The This constitutional lawsuit that we've been going through the court hasn't got any major backers. It's us. Preserve Montgomery has been solely, that's Montgomery County, Virginia, has been solely focused on trying to support this lawsuit. You can donate money to pres uh, preserve Montgomery to help fund this lawsuit. So this, they want to say the big greens are behind this. It is a grassroots bunch of people. We have, we have knocked on a lot of doors to get people to give us $5, $10 or a thousand if they've got it. But that lawsuit that is uh, being challenged is being funded by the local citizens and so reach out to preserve montgomery ask them if there's something you can do donate money but you know highlight it tell people about it. people need to know that this section 324 will be used against them if it's allowed to stand yeah. right now it's being used against me and my friends and my and my neighborhood it's being used against the people of kentucky it's going to come to everybody if some corporation, if they get away with this in this instance, if some corporation with deep pockets wants to do something, the government will sanction it because they gave them. Citizens United, this is where it all come from. <laughs> you know, this all it's all tied together. It's all tied together. It's one big web. You can't fight. MVP without fighting Citizens United because that's how it got. That's why we're where we're at. Does that make sense? Yes. When a company right. makes promises that to violate the environmental can the company be required to I was reading in the chat. Uh when a promise is violated well, can the company be required to compensate for damages? Yeah, I see that. When a company makes promises that violate environmental law, can the company be required to be compensated for damages? Well, if the if the government agencies want to make them pay, but as long as we have corrupt, you know, um, I'm sure that uh, in MVP's case, they went to a lot of landowners and said, we're going to give you this amount of money, but with this amount of money, you can't 
you can't challenge us or anything we want to do. You know, they have these company law, uh, company, company, uh, written easement agreements that a lot of people signed. And then some of us had lawyers to help us do things. Um, good question. Can they be required? Yes, they can be required, but unless citizens put pressure on our government leaders, especially when the government leaders are coal barons themselves, <laughs> or uh, in which we need a DEP for a while, we had a, a guy named Austin Caperton, who was a coal mine operator as the head of the DEP. And he was also put in charge of bringing in the, the hydrogen hub, you know, until we citizens demand and there's a citizen's outcry enough loud enough that they make them do it. The only reason that uh, MVP got, got um, fined, small fines, $3 million is a small fine people. It may be big to me and boss all, but it's, a, it's just a pittance mm -hmm. in the bucket for a company was because the citizens put so much pressure on, they had to do something. They had to do something. Um, so that's, that's kind of the answer there. When is MVP going to stop work for the winter this year? They're not. They're not going to stop. Normally, they would stop probably around Thanksgiving. Uh, in 2018, they worked on my farm until February. They lost a bunch of permits, and they finally left. They are not going to stop. They're going to work around the clock because they know that they could be stopped if these cases get to court. So... We just got to keep pressure on FIPSA and the government agencies to protect the people. So really one quick follow-up question on that before we get to the next one. So essentially they're trying to create a fact on the ground before a lawsuit stops them. Yeah, they want to, yeah, they will yeah. say, they want to make the, they want the president when they were told to stop in 2018, and come with a restoration plan. Their restoration plan was, oh, we're going to bury 80 more miles of pipe before we stop. That was their plan to FERC. When FERC says stop work order, you need to, you need to uh, uh, stop what you're doing and fix up, you know, make sure there's no more environmental damage. Well, their idea was anything that's actually on the row already, we're going to go ahead and weld and put, dig the trench and put stuff in the ground. That was their plan. We stopped that. But, um, you need to put pressure on Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, FEMSA. Um, I'm trying to put pressure on them about this pipe coating, along with some other people that have been, I've been drumming on this for years. Um, we just need people, there's petitions. There's petitions you can sign. If you write something personal on those petitions, it actually makes a little more difference. Mm -hmm. Make it a personal, if it was just one sentence at the end of those petitions you can put on there. Um, that's how we stop this. Any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, I want to take a minute uh, to first of all, give a huge thank you to Maury for um, sharing all of his <laughs> insights with us uh, about this really critical struggle that he's been such a uh, such a vital part of uh, huge thank you to Mari for for um, uh, you know for being our presenter today and I want to thank all of you who attended uh, virtually as well as in person and uh, just want to leave you with a few words about the Institute for Policy Studies who's hosting this event. Uh, we are uh, the oldest multi-issue progressive think tank in the US, uh, dating back to actually the days of the Vietnam War in 1963. Uh, so we've been around Uh, we have uh, programs in a number of areas. I work with the climate justice program, but we also have 
programs on economic justice and demilitarization and uh, many other issues. And thank you very much. And let me wrap up here for a couple yes. of things. So yeah. um, thank you, Boss Off. It's been an honor to be here. It's always an honor to be here when, up here with people like you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Pennsylvania accepting an award. Introduced me as the hero from the holler. That's kind of a moniker that Sarah Hazelgrove did a great film a few years ago. And it's Hero of the Holler, and I've got that nickname. I will say this I'm not any more of a hero than Boss Off or anybody who's been in any of these struggles, have done something, anything. You're all heroes. So um, and if I can contribute a little bit, I'm very honored to do that. Um, I have the luxury of not having anything really tie me down. Um, like I told somebody, my kids are grown. The farm's been basically mothballed because we can't really farm it with the pipeline people there, neighbors taking care of some stuff. Um, after they came and blasted through the karst, my water got so tainted that I just turned it off. They will say they didn't do it. That will be an argument for later. <laughs> um, so I just can turn things off and just jump in the car and take off as long as the people continue to help support me to do that. Cole, free Curtis Betamar, even we'll miss your next event. Okay, well, so the Andrew is doing up in Baltimore. There's a cold free Curtis Bay tomorrow. So if you're up there and get all the Andrew, I'm sure he'd be glad to have some people come over. Um, cause we got to support each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think I have one more song. You got that about ready to play. So I want to say there's a, there's another one last song we're going to do as we leave here. And it's from the incredible Bernadette Peters. This was a song that she sang at the, um, june 8th rally in front of the white house that we did she's a fantastic singer uh community advocate uh climate warrior i can't say enough about her so like i said there was a um, a project that was just got completed there's about 40 artists from appalachia that came together to do some music that um cd will re will be released tomorrow i think band camp uh like I said, go to Artivism, Virginia, buy some great music, support this fight. Um, and I think we need, this is why we will win. And Bernadette's going to sing us out of here and tell you that we're going to keep our eyes on the prize. We will not stop until things are good for all, not some. Yeah. Yeah.
wow, that's an amazing way to, to end an amazing evening. Well, thanks to all of you for um, spending an evening with us to learn more about the Mountain Valley Pipeline struggle. And be sure to follow up on some of those uh, um, resources for more information and next steps to get involved uh, that we talked about here. Okay, thank you. Thank you.